In March 2001, a young man from Cork stood at the gates of a Buddhist monastery. He had heard that staying in a monastery was a way to get cheap accommodation. He was travelling around the Far East and wanted to save some money. Little did he know that a series of chance meetings would lead him to playing a part in saving the lives of many. What follows is some of his story. We hope you enjoy. And um, I was hitchhiking up through Thailand and this Thai guy picked me up and he said, well, you know, uh, there's, um, you can stay for free in monasteries in Thailand, you know? So I said, okay, free sounds, I can afford that. <laughs> I can afford free. <laughs> and uh, So he pulled, he dropped me outside this monastery. So in I go and the name of the monastery was Soon Mok. So I went into this monastery and um, thinking I was going in for a week and I stayed two years, I ordained as a monk. Mm. And for me it was the most beautiful, I still consider it probably the most, two most beautiful years of my life. Um, because we were living in a forest, we were, um, we couldn't handle money, everything that was given to us was given from the, the surrounding villages. Uh, we would walk around and bend the bat which with our with our bowls every morning and what people would f- put into your bowl, that's what you would eat. And the only, what what you gave in return was to practice, was to meditate, was to study, was to to, to go inside. And that was your duty. Um, and, and I did this for two years, two very, very powerful years. Um, but when I, when I ordained as a, as a monk, I couldn't have any money. So it was the start of a trip. It was the start of a, so I had about 4,000 euro because I didn't feel that it was my money. I didn't feel that this money was um, was mine because I had two wonderful years that otherwise I would have spent. So, the, you know, I would have spent backpacking, uh, traveling. So I, so India came into my mind. I said, okay, I'll go to India. And the intention to go to India was uh, find a charity that, that's doing work and just give them the money. You know, and somehow a circle will be will be born, and then maybe go back go back to the monastery again and and already. So um, so so I went back to India, um, and I went to Varanasi. It was the first place I went. Flew to Delhi, went to Varanasi because it was I, the first time I was there. It held something very special for me. And I don't know why, because I I've travelled you know poor countries before. Some to, so for some reason. People just started asking me for help. People started to know then if their child was sick and if they, uh, you know, if they didn't have money for medicine, that I would, um, you know, I would take them to the hospital and I, you know, I would pay for, for medicine. So kind of the word got out. I was giving from a place of this is not from my heart. I was giving from a very logical place. This is wrong. I began to understand in Varanasi that if you don't have money for medicine and if your child is sick, your child, your child won't get medicine, you know, and uh, my, my heart was was like stone, you know. I went from two extremes. I went from Thailand as a Buddhist monk, where everything is beautiful, and you're living in a monastery, and you're in meditation, and you're in a community, and you're supported, to suddenly being this person that was just seeing the what poverty was. In about two weeks before my visa was up, the, um, the. Um, it was like it was like a, a belt in my back of my head right here. I was walking down the street, and it was like, and I was literally went forward, and it was like you can't go. I was like, what in my mind? What you can't go? I hated India. I hated everything that it represented. I hated the poverty, you know, and um, and there was this thing, you can't go. And I was like, what? I can't go. My visa's up. Mm-hmm. I don't have any money. Um, and, but it was just a very powerful, you can't go. So I was like, am I crazy? So, um, so I said, okay, I'll do everything I can do. And in India being India, I, um, I went to an official and I ended up bribing him and he extended my visa. So I rang up the airline, no problem. Mm. <laughs> no problem, he said, no problem. <laughs> no fees, no fees. Um, so extended it, extended the thing. And the very day that I was supposed to fly out, a doctor that I'd knew, known from the government hospital contacted where I was staying. And he said, uh, and the message was, look, we have a child critically ill. Can you come and have a look? And uh, maybe you can help. So I said, OK, this is the reason. The reason to stay the extra month is for this child. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, so I let him know. I said, no problem. I said, uh, 
um, I'll, I'll, uh, so I went to the hospital, to the government hospital. And uh, so when I met this doctor, he said, look, we've already transferred this child to, uh, to a private hospital. He said it was a small private hospital um, that he said it was known to, to give children a bed, a sick, sick children for a bed, because in the government hospital, if you don't have money for medicine, um, they won't admit you because they'll say there's no point. And if you can't afford the medicine, there's no point in you taking a bed. So, um, so I did. I, so you I vouched said, for this. You vouched for the medicine for this. Yeah, child. yeah. I said, look, start medicine, start treatment, no problem. So I went into the doctor, and within five minutes, we we'd set up this the Varanasi Children's Hospital. Suddenly, it was like I went in with no intention of setting up anything, just to start a treatment. And he started telling me how many children, you know, potentially there were that were in this circumstance, and. Uh, and he was just setting up a private hospital and he'd more space than he needed. So within, I'd say within two seconds, you know, once the idea came, like we can start the project here. And then it reached a point, correct me if I'm miss- missing something here now, but it reached a point where you, um, it became more than you could carry yourself and you were burnt out from it. I carried this project for a long time and yeah, I was absolutely burnt out. I, I'd reached very low and dark places because, you know, I, we would do a fundraiser and, um, and uh, even after the fundraiser, there would be a tension in my, in my, in my stomach. What, you know, we might raise a thousand euro or, you know, two thousand euro. And even like the day after, it was like the tension in my stomach. Okay, what's the next fundraiser? Mm. You know, how are we going to get the next chunk of money? And, and I was in a very dark and lonely place because ultimately it was my responsibility. It was my responsibility because, you know, most people in the West, they haven't seen what I have seen. Mm. They haven't seen poverty. Mm. When I speak to the old people um, here in Ireland about poverty and what it's like in India, you know what, there's tears in their eyes because they can remember that poverty. Mm. They can remember malnutrition. They can remember TB. They can remember every family, one or two children dying. That was normal. Mm. You know, they have an emotional connect. Mm. You know, very few people of my generation have seen the poverty that I have seen. Mm. And so with that becomes a huge responsibility. Mm. You know, because you, you understand that what you, what you have seen, and because you've been able to create something, that's a tremendous responsibility. Mm-hmm. Knowing that if I didn't find the money, then children wouldn't be treated, and that's the reality. And that's the reality still. A year and a half ago, I had, um, I reached a very dark and lonely place, and I just couldn't get the energy to find the money. I just couldn't, you know, everything I did, I just couldn't. I was a, a very, very insecure, very in a very low place, and I couldn't create an honor fundraiser. We'd reached the point where our medicine supplier said, we're not supplying you any more medicine because you owe too much money and we can't afford it, you know. We, you owe like 7,000 euro, which is a lot here, but it's a huge amount over, um, over in India. So, and in me, I just I can't find this money. And, uh, I had to make the decision on this night to, to close the hospital. We're going since 2004. This is the first time we actually closed the doors. We said no more, we can't, no more admissions, you know. And, uh, and I got up to, off the phone and I just started bawling, crying. You know, I was just like, I failed. You know, this thing that, that I had been given to do, um, I failed that, um, that um, and the consequences of me failing were dire. You know, it was absolutely, uh, and uh, and I was in a very, you know, literally. I I'm not joking when I say this. There was tears on the floor, and uh, about ten minutes later, this uh, this guy picked me up. Uh, this guy rang me, and he said, um, he said you probably don't remember me. He said I picked you up hitchhiking, um, two or three months ago. And um, and um, he said, you were telling me about the project. Now, normally when I'm hitchhiking or that, I don't tell people about what I'm doing because, you no, know, it's, it's too much, you know. Um, but anyways, for some reason, obviously, I told this man, I mentioned him, and he said, 
And uh, he said, I was thinking of you. And he said, I, I looked up the, your website. And he said, I'll tell you why, why I did that. He said, I was reading this book. And in the book it asked, do you have everything that you want? And he said, if the question is yes, he said, uh, it said, um, look around and can you do with something, do without something that you have? And uh, he looked around and he, he said there was, a, there was an envelope full of money because he was after collecting rent. And he said that my, my, I popped into his mind and he'd remembered Varanasi and he'd remembered that it was a hospital. So he whatever, Googled it and he found our website. And um, so this was 10 minutes after I put down the phone to, to them and said, close the doors. And he said, and uh, he said, so I have some money for you. He said, uh, I have a thousand euro. Mm. And like, honestly, my, I started bawling, crying on the phone. I said, you have no idea what this means. You mm. know, you have no idea. And for me, I suppose it was... The universe, if you care to call it, the universe was saying, was holding me and saying, you've done this for long enough. Mm. Um, you've done this. It was a kind of a, a vilification of what I was doing. It was like, yes, in this moment of your, your greatest need, the universe was there. The darkness that I felt that, that, that I was in for so many years, the very dark place, I understood now that actually I was growing from that. You know, it was like I was a seed. And suddenly when I met Yi and, I, and uh, when this moment happened and then within two or three months, I met, the, you know, I kind of started to meet people here in Cork and they started to, to help with the fundraising. And suddenly it's like, you know, I've become a shoot. Um, I've come over the ground. Um, this tension is gone. And, and I see the very difficult times that I was in was actually growing me, was making me strong inside. I remember one time that, um, that it, they rang me up and my first thought was, how much, my first question was, not what was the child suffering from, was how much is this going to cost? Mm -hmm. And I was like, my God, how far have I come? Mm -hmm. And But that's the reality. You know, that's the reality that, that that's, um, it is how much is this going to cost? Mm -hmm. Can we afford it? Mm -hmm. Can I find that money? Mm -hmm. And uh, there have been times that I've had to say no. There have been times where it's been, you see, you weigh up everything. You know, I talk to the doctor and he might say to me, look, the, the prognosis is very poor. Even if we, even if we treat, the prognosis is poor and maybe it's going to cost six, seven, eight hundred euro because a critically ill child, you know, medicine is, is cheap out there. But, you know, you could, here in Ireland, you could spend a hundred thousand hmm. very easily on, on a child or an adult on medicine. Medicine is expensive, mm. you know, so we wouldn't spend a hundred thousand, obviously, but, you know, you could spend eight hundred a thousand, mm. you know, it wouldn't be unusual, you know, we, we would get maybe one or two or three children like this in a year, and uh, depending where we are financially, um, yeah, I've had to make that decision. Um, when it comes to the point where, you know, 500 euro, What's the, what's the value of a, of a child? You know, when you have to be that clinical, you know, this is the, this is the world that we're living in and I'm part of this world. Mm -hmm. Yet, you know, when you have to make decisions like that, it's, it's humongous, you know, it's absolutely, it's, um, it's the worst feeling. You know, I don't think about the, I don't think about the thousands of children that we've saved and I know we've saved. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, this is rare. But when this happens, this is what breaks your heart. You know, what we do is writing a wrong. It's like a, in a court case, if justice is served, mm. then that's right. Mm. There's no, you, nobody brags about when justice was served. Nobody, because that's what it should be. Mm. People, people will sit when justice isn't served. That's the tragedy. Mm. That's the thing that people will, will scream about. Mm. And, uh, and uh, you know, when, when for some reason we can't, for, for a reason we can't afford to treat a child, that's injustice. Mm. Like I remember the first child that I saw with malnutrition, her name was Tisa. Um, and I was walking through this slum area and I'd actually got lost. And uh, I came across this family that were sitting outside a hut and there was this tiny little child 
And I thought was her, she was um, six months, you know, just a baby. And then I spoke to the family and she was two years of age. Mm. And suddenly, you know, there, there was, I couldn't believe it. There was malnutrition. There was a child dying of malnutrition. And, um, and I suppose that's really how we started to work in, in Varanasi um, and how we started the malnutrition center um, because we brought her to the hospital and, you know, for me, I, I couldn't believe it. And I still can't believe it. I still can't believe that the world that we're in, that there's, there's children dying of hunger. People have said to me about the concern ad, they've said, you know, I can't watch it. The, it's too much for me. For me, when I see the concern ad, ad I can't not watch it. Mm. For me, every time I see the concern ad and these children that are malnourished, my eyes begin to water. I start to cry inside because I, I know this is real. You know, sometimes we find children too late. Sometimes we don't find them at all. And, um, you know, when you see a child come in, when a child comes into our malnutrition centre and you see in their eyes, they only want food and there's a disbelief in their eyes. You can see it. You know, I'm, I'm just hungry. Why don't you feed me? And it's some, it, 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 for me, it's the worst thing imaginable. It's the, the most worst wrong that a child would, uh, would be hungry, that a child would die because of hunger. You know, and I know I'm going back to that. You know, it's not the, the malnutrition that is in India. It's not obvious. You have to search it out. These children are considered they're weak children and they're kind of, they're hidden. Every family you go to in, um, you speak to in, in India, they've had one or two children that have died. That's just the way it is, mm. you know. And, um, and so our job is to, is to look for these children. And when you find them, you know, when we find these children, it's incredible. You see life returning. Mm. You know, you see they just need food. The family needs education. Um, we have like a 90% success rate when we find a child that's severely malnourished. But I suppose I'm also aware you've schools going, you've started some schools as well. Yes, we have three schools. Uh, we, prob we teach 300 children every day. Um, what we teach is, uh, because of funding is a problem, you know, we don't have that much money. So we don't have qualified teachers. We trained local women um, that have a certain level of education. We put them on teacher training courses. We can instill on those people, on these children, the value of education, that education has a value. In places like Africa, they treat malnutrition. 80% of the malnutrition is treated in the villages with this amazing product. It's called Plumpy Nut. It's basically a peanut based bar. Um, something like 98% of it is peanuts and uh, it's fortified with vitamins. Now the Indian government hasn't allowed this in up until last year. Um, when I found out about this product, when we started, obviously when you start treating malnutrition, you're looking, I wanted to, what's the best way to treat malnutrition? And, uh, and obviously this product came up mm. and, um, and this has been my dream. To be, you know, for me, malnutrition, is, this is where my heart is. Um, when you see a child just, just dying, and I've seen child, children dying from hunger, you know, because we've found them too late. They've come into us too late. Um, when you see this, there's, you can never look back. Mm. There is something that, that is touched. They, they can never be erased. They can never be forgotten. Um, and I've seen this, you know, and uh, my heart has been broken so many times out in India. Hmm. This has been my dream to, once I found out about this, how they're treating malnutrition hmm. in Africa, was to go out and get a mobile malnutrition unit and go to the villages and use this product. We were waiting for the government to approve it. The government are just starting to approve it, hmm. the Indian government. Um, and we want to be one of the first charities. Uh, there's another charity who's been given approval for at Medicine to Frontiers. We've gone out and worked with them for three days, see how they're working. And uh, now we're applying as an Indian charity to to uh, to start this uh, a mobile malnutrition unit. Mm. 
for every one, for every four malnourished children that we find that need to come in now to our hospital, only one will come in because the, the mother needs to come in and that's not feasible. You know, for a lot of cases, they can't because the mother is either working, she's looking after the family. Yeah, there's, a, well, there's an agency here called SHARP and they've just approved, they said that if we get a government approval, um, that they're, they've given us some monies before, that they're, they're going to um, fund a van, which is about €9,000, mm. going to buy a new van. And what's the other organisation, the very big organisation whose name they, that works... That have that are giving you guidance in this project. Uh, UNICEF. UNICEF are validating your project as well. Yeah, the UNICEF helped us to set up a mal the malnutrition center. They've guided us in this. UNICEF are backing our proposal. It costs fifty euro to put it to, with this product to treat uh, a child with severe malnutrition. Uh, that's a, on a six week course. Uh, you, this product, all the money goes directly out to India. We've no administration costs here. Um, I don't pay all my travel, everything, all my expenses. It's it it that they're not borne by me, you know. So everything that's given goes directly to the point of need. We're a fully registered charity in Ireland, uh, and we're a fully registered Indian charity. Look, life is life, and a child is a child, and that's what has touched me when I've seen this. I've seen the the that innocence of a child, and uh, when you see this. And when you see them dying of poverty, which is happening in our world right now, this is happening. The children are dying because they're poor. Oh, this is horrific.